everybody. I'm Rick Sanchez, and this is a special report that we're uh, bringing you tonight as we get uh, ominous information about uh, what's going on right now in, uh, inside of Iraq. Apparently, Iran has decided to retaliate uh, against the United States by hitting not one, but now we understand two military installations of the United States inside of Iraq. It's a story that certainly bears both analysis and information that we are going to be bringing you throughout this special report. Here's the headline. Iran has now officially retaliated. In fact, they're claiming responsibility for two attacks against U.S. military installations, both of them inside of Iraq. In fact, we just learned just seconds before going on the air that uh, they're actually giving a name to this attack. They're calling it Operation Revenge Soleimani. Pardon me, Revenge Martyr. Soleimani, revenge, martyr Soleimani. So uh, here's where we sit as we set the table for what's going on here and something people are now watching around the world as well. The Pentagon has been briefed. The president of the United States has been briefed. We are told he has been uh, pulled aside and he is meeting now with national security officials. Uh, Congress, in the form of uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, has been also called by the White House, and she has been briefed about what particular plans may, uh, what may be next. Uh, we're told the United States is readying for some kind of response. Uh, exactly what kind of response, we don't know yet, but there is a bevy of fresh information that is continuing to roll into us, and we are going to share every bit of it with you uh, as we get it. Let me tell you what we are going to do here from a programming standpoint. Uh, my colleague, uh, Michelle Greenstein, is going to be joining us. She's following all the very latest on the information that's coming in from Iran. And I should tell you, as we watch Michelle there, that much of the information, the preliminary information, did not come in stateside. It came in from uh, Iran. They're the ones who have been saying, yes, we did this, essentially claiming responsibility. Uh, we're also going to be taking you to uh, Washington, D.C., the area around the White House. That's uh, where you see now my colleague, Farron Franzek. Uh, Farron's going to be checking in. Uh, and uh, sharing with us all the official response that we're getting from uh, sources like the NSA, the Pentagon, uh, the White House, and obviously uh, reaction from uh, Congress uh, as well. Uh, here on set, I'm joined by um, our analysts, uh, Max Blumenthal, uh, who have all, you've all come to know, who has experience in this particular area. He's both an author and an editor. Uh, and Mike Malouf, a former uh, Pentagon official who's uh, joining us now uh, to take us through this as well. So let me read to you the last uh, bit of information, and this is coming to us from uh, Iran, and that is that uh, they're saying the Aerospace Force of Iran's Islamic Revolution Corps has fired several ballistic missiles at the al-Assad base of American troops in Iraq in retaliation for the assassination of General Qassam Soleimani. It goes on to call this, as I mentioned earlier, Operation Martyr Soleimani. And then it goes on to say that Iraqi forces, or at least Iraqi resistance forces, are also joining in, and they're now hitting a U.S. base there as well. This seems to be uh, perhaps a minor escalation, but a minor escal but an escalation no less. Uh, Michael. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a very serious development, uh, and it's hopefully there's no casualties, uh, but but they're both. Uh, Why do you keep coming back to that? <clears throat> uh, if. If there are casualties, that is the red line for Trump to launch on Iran. Question. How do you hit a military installation with six missiles? Is that what the number well, is? It's higher than that, two dozen. Now. Two dozen missiles two and dozen. not have a casualty. It's, these are large areas. They're, uh, in, and they're, they're spread out. And uh, they probably had warnings, and they had uh, personnel on the base prepared to uh, take defensive action if uh, necessary. Is this, they were expecting this. These bases were on alert already. They, they knew those two bases were going to be hit if there was to be retaliation. By the way, we're just being told now that uh, the market is uh, being affected by this uh, drastically. Uh, stark uh, futures have plummeted, as uh, one might expect in a situation like this. Ma it's Max, war. Bro say again. This is war. Those are strong words. Well, Do you think we're at war? 
if there's a further response after this, and if there were no casualties and Trump lets it go like a one-off, just like that occurred last year when Hezbollah and, and, and uh, uh, Israel got into it briefly, and everything stopped. There was, was no, nothing further. But if this is just revenge, uh, attack, counterattack, and then it stops, then How? maybe that could bring about a cooling off period if there are no casualties. Max Blumenthal, let me bring you into this conversation. How do we, uh, how do you create a sense of hesitancy with all that's going on right now that we've reported over the last four, uh, over the last uh, course of the last 45 minutes? The U.S. has essentially been at war with Iran for years through vicious economic sanctions, by spurring violent protests that have caused casualties and attacks on state facilities and banks. And the U.S. finally crossed a red line with the killing of Qasem Soleimani. All along during this period, the Senate Democrats stood by and voted for sanctions and violation of the Iran deal and allowed this war and this escalation to take place. And now we're hearing from the senior Democrat on the Armed Services Committee in the Senate, Jack Reed, that if there are indeed casualties at the al-Assad uh, military base, um, that it will be very difficult to just simply say, let's stop. So in other words, yeah. we will see Senate Democrat leadership sign off. On a on, declaration of war. On essentially a declaration of war. Yeah. And this could escalate over the next few months into, who knows what, a regional war. Well, I mentioned a little while ago that much of the information is coming to us from uh, Iran. Uh, let me get my colleague uh, Michelle Greenstein in place so she can try and uh, bring us up to date. Uh, Michelle, what, what is Iran putting out there uh, on the record? What are they saying publicly at this point? Well, firstly, Rick, it's important to note that even though the Pentagon is talking about two air bases being under attack, so far we only have confirmation from the IRGC via press TV about that first air base, the Al Assad Air Base, which is very close to Baghdad. Now, according to the IRGC, this operation name, like you said, was Operation. Operation Martyr Soleimani. And in an IRGC statement, which we're going to put up for you on the screen right now, it said a number of things. The first thing is that any U.S. response is going to result in further retaliation from Iran. The second thing is that all regional allies who are responsible, according to Iran, for assisting U.S. troops will also be directly targeted. Let's put that statement up on the screen for you guys. The next thing is that the U.S. and Israel are now considered one by the Iranian government, and that the IRGC will not not separate what they call the Zionist regime with what they call the criminal U.S. regime. And the fourth and final thing is that the U.S. must must withdraw all troops from the region. Now, what's interesting here is that Saeed Jilani, who is a representative of the Supreme Leader of Iran, tweeted out an Iranian flag just moments after that first attack, which some say is kind of a response to what President Donald Trump did after our assassination of General Soleimani, which was tweeting out an American flag. Now, the mm. IRGC in addition to calling for a complete withdrawal of U.S. troops from the country, said that it would not differentiate, like I said, between the U.S. and Israel, and that because the U.S. did kill what they call a national hero, that all options are, in a way, on the table. Now, this, of course, comes right after Iran's parliament approved a bill designating all U.S. military forces as terrorists. And, of course, as we know, just a day after millions of people poured into packed streets of Tehran yeah. to pay homage to General Soleimani, who, as, as we know, as, was assassinated on U.S. President Donald Trump's order. As a matter of fact, Michelle, let me, let me hold you. Let, let, let me just hold you right there. Uh, I think we have some of those pictures, and I think Michelle makes a really good point. Uh, Michael, you had uh, referred to this earlier. This is uh, the video that we have now right. that uh, we saw for the very first time. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who are uh, just now getting caught up on this story, uh, Iran has retaliated against the United States. They've done it forcefully. They've done it publicly. And it's, according to them, and now many media sources as well, it's been done not just on one military base, but on uh, a second military base. Uh, and what's interesting is one of them is in Erbil. Erbil. And, uh, in the Kurdistan, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, in the north. Yeah. Which, 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 does that surprise you? No. Not at all, because okay. that, that's, that's one of our other big bases. So we're looking at the map right now. There you see the area up there around Erbil. Then you see the other one, Al-Assad, which correct. is not far from Baghdad. Both of them hit, according to the Iranians. They're doing this uh, with cooperation of uh, Iraqi uh, resistance. Um, let's see if we can get uh, Farron Franzak up. Uh, my colleague Farron Franzak is uh, just following the latest for us right now on what's going on there. Uh, as far as reaction, direct, specific reaction, 
uh, from the U.S. side. Farron, what are you hearing? Yeah, so Rick, you know, we are in the midst of a 2020 presidential election, so we have things pouring over Twitter right now between Democrats and Republicans. Obviously, Democrats like Joe Biden, who's running for a chance at the presidency, saying that this is the reason why we shouldn't have picked Donald Trump in the first place, and he's driving us more towards war. Then you also have um, the Democratic hopeful nominee, uh, Pete Buttigieg, saying tonight Americans in Iraq are under fire. My prayers are with them, their loved ones, and their families. You'll, you'll note that he also was a veteran who served overseas as well. Then you also have Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, who says that she is closely monitoring the situation with these bombings that were targeting the U.S. troops in Iraq. But it's an interesting note that we have Senator Rand Paul stepping forward right away to immediately notify Trump and the rest of Congress that we are not at war yet. We are not at war because war has to be declared by the Congress. And he has made that very, very clear in his tweet saying and the administration needs to bring any discussion of war with Iran to the American people and their representatives in Congress as the Constitution requires. So, again, mm. Rand Paul coming forward with that adamant statement. But, again, you're getting kind of reaction from both Democrats and Republicans, all and pointing fingers at each other, and then also the big one, Donald Trump. Right. It, it seems almost uh, disheartening to know that uh, people are, at this point at least, uh, politicizing this situation. But then again, I don't think any of us should be surprised. And to your point, uh, Max, and, and I think it's a salient point to make in a situation like this. Since this situation began, we have been trying here on this newscast and at this network to bring the information forward as best we could without essentially cheerleading for either side. But it does seem that both from a political standpoint and from a journalistic standpoint, we have seen a lot of cheerleading since this thing began. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump politicized this the moment that it took place, and he showed up the following day at a far right wing evangelical church in Miami where he held the equivalent of a campaign rally with members of the Christian right praying over him and then him boasting about killing Soleimani, who he portrayed as an arch terrorist. And so he was trying to leverage this killing for his campaign, his upcoming reelection campaign. And let me, let me just interrupt you for a minute because yeah. it behooves then the question that has not been asked enough, it seems, uh, does the United States have a right to essentially execute, assassinate a public official of another country? And that's a very, very serious question, because it's the one that needed to be asked as we drew up to the situation where we are now. Uh, joining us now is uh, Danny Scherzen uh, by phone. Danny, as uh, you know, if you watch our newscast, is uh, a frequent guest. Uh, he taught at uh, West Point, served in Afghanistan, and also served in Iraq. Uh, Danny, what say you? And maybe you could pick up the point of uh, the idea that the question should maybe have been asked a week ago or so somewhat adamantly about the United States' right to assassinate a foreign military commander. Well, first of all, I'm almost speechless about what's happening tonight, and uh, I'm not much for prayers, but uh, I think it needs to be said that my thoughts and hopes are with uh, not only U.S. military personnel, potential casualties, but uh, Iraqis, because they're the victims. This is happening on their soil. As for the legality uh, and the strategic folly, I think, of this strike on Soleimani, look, this this is very questionable, at the very least, very dubious in terms of national and international law. Uh, the idea that we're going to assassinate the second or third most powerful person in a sovereign nation, a uniform member of their government, without a declaration of war, without actual evidence being provided to the American people, is deeply troubling. And Trita Parsi of the Quincy Institute said on Democracy Now! just two days ago that uh, he fears that for people like John Bolton, who are obviously cheering from home right now, Trump's move, uh, whether legal or not, uh, may have constituted an irreversible escalation. And, and that's what I fear tonight, because this retaliation on the behalf of Iran, uh, who knows where this leads, but I don't think it ends well. Thank you, uh, Danny. Uh, stand by. Uh, Michael, I want to bring you in, because we have to start talking about what the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the next thing we probably will hear is either uh, an announcement from the White House at some point tonight as to what the United States is going to do, the fact that they've already reached out to Congress, the fact that they've already meet, uh, been meeting with officials with the uh, NSA. Um, indicates that there is a conversation taking place. Well, the national security team is together now, and they are planning next steps. 
it's clear that if the president indeed uh, addresses the nation tonight, we, we haven't confirmed that. But be, since you mentioned that, I should probably there's say that possibility. We're, we're getting information, and we're, we're we we here uh, our network has not yet confirmed this, but we're getting uh, information down the pipeline that the president of the United States may address the nation tonight. Uh, usually, what does that mean? Well, it could go one way or the other, and uh, uh, with Trump, it could mean that he's going to uh, respond even further, which I hope he does not. But uh, taking Max's point earlier, this is coming at a very interesting time. Why now? Why take Soleimani now, out now when two administrations, Democrat and Republican, had decided not to do it? Even the Israelis didn't do it. That isn't to say the Israelis didn't weren't tracking him. They were. And did they pass on the coordinates to uh, Trump, who was dumb enough to to uh, take take him up on it and and uh, and pull the trigger? Mm. This is probably so that the Israelis then could say it wasn't us. And that's what exactly what they're doing right now. Yeah. Fifteen minutes after the hour, for those of you just now catching up on what's going on, uh, Iran has retaliated against uh, U.S. military installations inside Iraq. In fact, two of them, uh, they are somewhat braggadociously saying that they didn't do it by themselves, that it's Operation Martyr Soleimani, and that they're doing it with uh, the help of uh, Iraqi forces, which is really a really important uh, distinction because, uh, and Max, maybe I should bring you in on this, if we do, uh, if war is inevitable, it's not just war with Iran. It is war that escalates into many other areas, mm -hmm. seemingly wherever Iran has militias. Am I right? Or where the U.S. has military bases. I mean, with the invasion of Iraq, what the U.S. has done is establish a perfect noose around Iran with its military bases, and these service members at these bases and contractors would, are sitting ducks. I would go one step further, wherever there are Shia. In the, in, the, in, the, in the region. Well, but let's, let's talk about that for just a well, moment. Dan, me, go, go ahead. I, I spoke to a former uh, NSC uh, official who oversaw Iraq under multiple administrations. He said he didn't even know that the U.S. base K-1 attacked in Kirkuk, which started this whole affair, even existed. So there are so many U.S. military bases. There are so many tar targets sitting there. And let's remember that all it took was Hezbollah getting these Cornet anti-tank rockets to push Israel out of southern Lebanon in 2000. Iran and its uh, allies in the region, its partners, are mm. really what they are. They have so much more military capacity. M maybe they we, hold all the cards here. Maybe we could put another map up. I want to bring Danny Scherzen back into the conversation. Danny, as we look at these, at this part of the world, I think it, uh, it behooves us to consider um, Iran's power does not lie in a traditional military the way we would define it when we think of traditional armies, as we often think, like in World War II. Their, their, their power seems to lie in the fact that they have so many tentacles around the world with different militias and organizations and, yes, even some terrorist groups who are beholding to them. How, how much of a threat is that if the inevit inevitability of uh, war arrives? You're right to say that Iran's threat is what military folks like to call asymmetric. Uh, on the more conventional side, they do have a slew of fairly uh, sophisticated and effective ballistic missiles, some of which would be <laughs> potentially deadly to uh, U.S. ships in the Gulf, which is one area of vulnerability for the United States. They also, how did you say, have proxy tentacles throughout the region, everywhere from Lebanon through Syria and Iraq and potentially even supporters in Yemen and Bahrain. So what we're looking at is, you know, the United States has littered the Middle East and the world with bases, especially over the last 19 years. And in one sense, that seems to be power projection. But it's also vulnerability because what the United States does not control is the space in between its bases, often which... Iran has more influence in, or at least Iran has some proxy forces in. So I would look at America's presence, its dotted bases in the region, as as much liability as strength at this point. Danny Scherzen, thank you for that. Let's go, let's go back to Michelle Greenstein real quick. Michelle, I understand that you have some uh, brand new information, specifically uh, market related, as to uh, what's happening with the markets right now on this news. That's right, Rick. According to Press TV, following these strikes early Wednesday morning, oil prices jumped 4.5 percent at one point, and the benchmark WTI jumped as much as 4.53 percent to 65. 
$1.54 a barrel before shortly after settling down. Now, global stock markets have also taken a plunge in reaction to these escalating tensions. And we have Wall Street stocks losing ground. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 0.4% and the S&P 500 shed 0.3% to finish the day. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, let's go over to Farron now and find out uh, what's going on as far as reaction uh, from the United States. Uh, uh, notwithstanding any political reaction, what are we hearing news-wise, Farron? Um, so, Rick, so as far as the Pentagon, um, the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Secretary of Defense Mark Esper. They have arrived at the White House. They are sitting behind closed doors with President Donald Trump. He has been briefed on all of this, and they are also sitting down with the NSA. It's also important to note that uh, the Pentagon has been reporting that um, a local news source near the uh, Barksdale airspace, they're reporting that they have been sending out B-52 bombers all week, and they're actually getting ready to send out more. However, their uh, De Defense Secretary Mark Esper has said the United States is not seeking war with Iran, but they're prepared to finish one. Hmm. Also, it's important to note that with um, the serious attack, that the Pentagon is looking at this as these were missiles, not rockets. So the big question is going to be, as far as, you know, Michael Mouffe was saying before, is the number of casualties, if that's going to have an impact here, or if this was just infrastructure that they were trying to hit over at those bases there in Iraq. Rick? Good reporting, as usual, Farron. Thank you very much. Let's go back to you, Michael, on the question of what the U.S. military seems to be remobilizing, if that's a proper word, <laughs> and uh, they're moving some of their uh, outfits out of Iraq and, uh, you know, putting them in places like uh, Kuwait. Explain that to us. Well, the, pro the point is, 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 is uh, putting them into a, an area that uh, uh, gets them out of immediate harm's way, although the missiles could reach the, G the GCC. So countries. this is a defensive move, not it, an offensive it, it, move? It's sort of defensive. Uh, you got to keep in mind that Iraqi missile, uh, uh, Iranian missiles historically have not been all that accurate but uh, but, but 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 that said the fact is is that if there's an attack then on one of the arab countries where us bases are that raises the ante considerably that then possibly brings them in uh, into the fray so the question we're all asking ourselves right now as we bring you this news which we learned up now oh about uh, an hour and 10 15 minutes ago is what's next? What is going to be the uh, reaction, the re-retaliation, if you will, from the United States after two of our military installations in Iraq uh, have been uh, hit? Uh, Iran is publicly uh, claiming responsibility for this attack, which makes uh, many wonder uh, what the United States uh, will do next. Max Blumenthal has been following this situation for us as well. Max, um, help us, help our viewers understand the ire in that part of the world that many here in America don't see because we don't watch those newscasts. And maybe sometimes people don't watch global newscasts like ours as to what this assassination of Soleimani has meant to that region. You have the U.S. supporting a 70-year-plus occupation of Palestine to the tune of $4 billion a year. You had the U.S. support a, an Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon that created Hezbollah. You had the U.S. support a brutal Israeli assault on Lebanon, including Beirut, in 2006, that devastated the civilian population after the U.S. invaded Iraq, mm. costing a million lives. Then the U.S. proceeds to impose brutal sanctions on Iran, surrounds Iran with military bases. The region mobilizes against ISIS, which many people blame the U.S. for helping to create by arming the so-called moderate rebels in Syria. The anger that so many people in this region, and particularly Shia, who have faced extermination, now feel it's, bo it's boiled over because of the assassination of Soleimani. And let's, let's understand how insane the assassination of Soleimani was. We're being told he was plotting imminent attacks. In fact, according to the Iraqi prime minister, Qasem Soleimani was in Baghdad with the knowledge of the Trump administration to participate in a de-escalation initiative between Iran and Saudi Arabia. He was apparently on a peace mission when he was killed. This could have all been avoided if it were not for the rash actions of a dangerous president. Miles and miles of people, a sea of humanity literally has taken to the streets over the last 48 hours. Uh, in fact, over the last 72 hours in that part of uh, Tehran, all of them wanting to get a final glimpse and a final farewell of uh, Qasem uh, Soleimani. Look at these pictures. Uh, that is what uh, Max was talking about. I don't know if it's what the United States expected. Uh, Secretary of State, our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has mentioned that he thought the people of Iran would look at the death of Soleimani as something 
that they would uh, welcome. Instead, it seems, at least visually, to have been uh, just the opposite. Uh, there's a side note to our coverage tonight, and that is uh, this area here in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, was hit with a snowstorm this afternoon, and it meant that uh, the Pentagon was actually affected by this. Uh, Farron, do you have some details on that? Yeah, actually, uh, Rick, you know, we were talking about how the Defense Secretary Mark Esper and Secretary Pompeo had to come over into the White House because there's basically almost nobody at the Pentagon. They said that there's a few handful of people uh, huddled behind closed doors at the Pentagon, but mainly everybody went home before the 5 o'clock hour. And if you look at the time frame of when that first J missile attack staff. happened, Joint it was at 5.30 p.m. And now, you know, it's, it seems that everyone was well, well at home before that first missile attack there from uh, so leaving it, from the Pentagon because, again, as you mentioned, because yeah. of the snowstorm. It's a fascinating detail, and I'm glad you brought it. Michael, you worked at the Pentagon. You know, are we to infer from this that our intel was that bad, that there was nobody who saw this coming and was prepared for it? Since oh, they were prepared for it. There, there is, in fact, uh, p personnel uh, on, on watch 24-7. There's an operations center within the Pentagon, and they watch these things constantly, and they relay them on to the secretary. He's probably over at the Situation Room in the, in the White House, but that doesn't mean that the, there isn't a critical staff at the Pentagon at all times, and there are. Uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that goes without saying. They're taking information from everywhere, and, and uh, they're, they're constantly monitoring everything. It's, it's not surprising. By the way, we still, and, and this really is an important detail, as we watch this video, by the way, that video you're seeing right there is the first video that we here received. Now, this is from Iranian television, almost in a, as I think I mentioned earlier, in a braggadocious way, they seem to be saying, here's the video of our missiles going out and attacking those, mil uh, those bases, those installations as a retaliatory effort to, uh, you know, uh, martyr uh, our uh, military commander, uh, Qasem uh, Soleimani. So this is video that you're seeing here that they actually uh, released as if to publicly take credit uh, for what they're doing. And then the question is, as we wind things down here, what will the U.S. reaction be, Max? Well, CNN's reporting that Trump will deliver an address at some point tonight, uh, which does indicate a retaliation. If I understand Trump's thinking, that's what we can expect. 75 percent of Americans, according to a September 2019 University of Maryland poll, including a majority of Republicans, oppose war with Iran. And so the opposition cuts deep into Donald Trump's base. And this Saturday, there will be national rallies against war with Iran. These will be massive, unprecedented in size since the rallies against the war in Iran. We are going to be staying with this story. My thanks to Michelle, to uh, you as well, Mike, and mm -hmm. uh, to Max, and to Farron Franzak. Uh, Danny Scherzen, all of us uh, here at RT are going to stay on top of this story. And as information comes in, we'll share it with you immediately. We'll be back when it's time to do news again.